probably noticed on the description on the box, I do some pretty weird stuff with chocolate, um, like bacon and cheese and oysters and olive oil. And a lot of people ask me, how do I come up with these concepts? And what I realized is that actually the concept comes first and the recipe comes second. And I wanted to walk you through my creative process because I think it actually applies to pretty much everything everyone's been talking about here. So step one, fall in love. Step two, find the inspiration. Step three, take the action. And step four, share the experience. So for me, I fall in love with travel very frequently when I find architecture and religions and people and movements and artists. And that's what I really fall in love with. And so I wanted to show you some of the things, how I translated those loves into chocolate. So this is a beautiful cathedral by Antonio Gaudi, um, Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona. When I was um, living in Rosas and working with Ferran Adria, I would come down to Barcelona and just stare at this cathedral. And I just thought it was incredible, this dreamlike drippiness. And I started looking more into Gaudi, and I saw that he used a lot of different mosaic work. Um, and I decided that I would tell a story about his architecture using Spanish saffron with white chocolate and dark chocolate and rolled in different colors of sugar crystals to represent his mosaic work. And then um, yoga and chocolate. A lot of people ask how that came together. And I have um, a little factory here in Chicago, and we have one sacred space. I always think it's important to have a sacred space in your house or in your work where we use that for yoga classes or for educational classes or for, for people needing a break. And um, one day after the class, I went to our little chocolate room and I got a naga truffle, which is a curry and coconut milk chocolate truffle. And I tasted it and I was really alarmed because I thought maybe they had changed the recipe and I didn't know what had happened. And I called my production manager and I said, did we get a different curry in or did you do a different process? because that was the best chocolate I've ever had. And he said, no, we didn't change anything. So I called my friend, David Romanelli, who's a yoga instructor, and I said, there's a real lesson about chocolate in yoga. And he said, what's that about? I said, I think that if you eat something after a yoga class, like the whole experience is just 10 times more amplified. And what it was is like when you're finally in the present moment and out of your head, any experience is amplified. So we started doing these yoga and chocolate workshops around the country, and then we actually did this yoga and chocolate box that had comes with a booklet and sort of the step-by-step -step guide of doing an asana followed by a chocolate, which stimulates a certain organ. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. And then my, um, my husband's really interested in motorcycles, and um, was talking to me about the history of Harley-Davidson and old motorcycles, and so, we got this 1963 Harley and loaded the saddlebags up with chocolate and sold in the catalog one year. And then the full moon, I've always been very drawn to the power of the full moon and the folklore around the full moon. You know, more babies born on the full moon, more murders and why. And So when we were coming up with the concept to do a chocolate of the month club, I said we have to do it around the Celtic lunar calendar and send the chocolate a week before the full moon with the ritual, and then people will get the chocolate, do the ritual under the light of the full moon, and isn't that much more significant? So, um, so step two is once you're in the blissful state of love, this is where the creativity comes in. So the inspiration, you kind of naturally go into inspiration where you connect with your medium, whether it's the neighborhood project or architecture or theater, or in my case, chocolate. And so I start trying to associate this connection between this love of beauty or cause or curiosity into the inspiration that translates into the storytelling of the chocolate. And when I was little and um, uh, growing up in Indiana, I would wake up to Bob Marley every morning because my mom used to put her makeup on to Bob Marley. And in the beginning, I just... I loved the music and I loved the beat. And then I started listening to what he was saying and I got really interested in this, this social commentary, this, this message through music. And so when I started Vosges, I really kind of, he kind of like went through me in a way of that like everything I, need, I made needed to have a reason for being and needed to have a story. So ultimately I ended up creating this collection about um, 
Zion. And so it started with Bob Marley. So it started with the love of Bob Marley, which brought me to this idea of what Rastafarianism is, this political and religious movement of the 30s, which got me to Haile Selassie, which brought me to Ethiopia, back to Jamaica, who really took Rastafarianism to um, this religious state, and then the land. And then I started thinking about all the ingredients that the people grow in the land. And so came up with um, hemp seed, calabasa, Jamaican allspice, scotch bonnet, peppers, tamarind, and sorrel. And then the collection of Zion was born. And then action. This is a really, 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 really critical, critical step to kick yourself and go do it. Um, I, I, I love this quote by Stanley Marcus who said, you know, there's people that are the dreamers and their heads are always in the clouds. And then there are those people that are the worker bees and their noses are always down to the grindstone. And then there's that rare person that's like 95% dreamer and 5% worker activist. And that's the person who really causes change in the world. And I always think of that when I'm creating new products because, you know, when you have a company that grows, you have all these other voices from ops and process and, and finance that that seem to hold back the action of creating something because they think it's not perfect. And I always say, well, my point is to create a product that's not perfect, that's about 75 to 80% of the way there. So I have 25 to 20% of, of that room to evolve as the collection is finally launched. So I really push, push, push to get the product out. And it's really critical for the next phase. So, the next step is the experience, the experience that you create for the consumer, but also the experience that the consumer engages with in your product. So I'm going to walk you through a collection called Groove, which started with me just loving music, you know, listening to CDs, flipping through the radio channels. And one time I was in Dallas, and I was in a rental car, and I was like, flipping through all the music on the channels. And um, I realized that it was basically all, oops, it was all hip hop. And I started thinking about what the roots and the influences were that made this happen. And so it brought me to the story of African Americans and how really they shaped America's, my favorite anyway, musical genres and really influenced the whole world from that. So I started going back through this path and looking at the different genres of music and associating with them um, stories of the artists that were most influential at the time and the foods that they might have eaten at, in that area. So with hip hop, I thought of decadence and gold leaf and champagne. So we did a Krug with white chocolate and champagne truffle. And the collection in total became one box with exploring 12 different genres of music, 12 truffles, a CD. So you would listen to the song, read the story about what was going on at the time, and then taste the chocolate. So it was the first multimedia collection that we did. And here's a picture of the box. And then I'm just going to tell you about a couple of genres of music that I did. So in thinking about soul and Motown, the Supremes and the Temptations and Stevie Wonder, I just thought it was so smooth it needed to be butter. <laughs> so I did a butter and truffle. And then bebop was this really fascinating era. It was, it was following big band, and it was not, um, it was very free flow artistic music. It was almost like they had their own language. Here's Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. And it was a time of a movement from Christianity to the Islamic religions. And I thought that was really fascinating and did Middle Eastern ingredients, um, which were Moroccan mint and sumac. And then the originating point was really the field songs. So I focused on African ingredients, um, yams and grains of paradise. And then this collection um, was really a curiosity study about how we always think that we taste with our tongue, but actually 90% of what we taste is through our sense of smell. So I explored this through this collection called Chocolate in the Nose. And this was the collection. There was 52 different aromas and chocolates with nothing added, no weird stuff in it, um, just plain single origin chocolate from different countries. And you played it almost as if it were a game. So you would taste the chocolate, and you would look at the sensory wheel, and then you would try to identify the nuances or the notes 
that were inherent in cacao. And that sensory wheel matched to those aromas, the shape of the aromas, whether it was herbaceous or nutty. And um, you would engage in this very elaborate um, collection in that way. And, um, and then I did this collection um, because I was very curious about fermentation. Because to me, I thought fermentation was basically rotting trash. And as I got into the food world, I realized that fermentation is used with cacao to make chocolate, is used with wine, is used with kimchi, is used with miso, is used with um, kefir, it's so many different things to actually create nuances of flavor. So I decided I wanted to explore that, and this collection was called The Curious Contemplation on Fermentation Through the Lustful Study of Cheese and Chocolate. <laughs> so we did this huge, amazing book. Um, and this bamboo box, and the, and the top of the box was actually used as a um, cheese board. And we did um, Korean fermented black garlic and various accoutrements, um, cheese and chocolate. So now we're getting to the good part, the guided tasting. So, okay, I'm going to lead you through this. So get your chocolate ready. Hopefully you still have some. If not, maybe your neighbor will share. And... Once you have that little piece in your hand, just a little square, you know, a little, a little piece. Okay, everybody ready? Okay. Close the mouth. No mouth, no biting, no, no touch. Don't do anything yet. And close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. And we're going to take three deep ujjayi breaths. Okay, ready? Open your eyes. Mind is quieted. And the first thing you're going to do is actually look at the chocolate as best you can. And notice, is it wet? Is it dry? Is it bumpy? Is there texture? And the next thing I like to do is take my thumb and my finger and kind of rub it against the chocolate. Your heat from your finger should start to help release some of the aromas in the chocolate and bring it up to your nose and smell. There's a variety of flavors, so whether it's the matcha green tea and you're sensing the seaweed notes from that, or the smokiness of the bacon, or the sweetness of the curry, smell that. And then take a bite. And I like to break up that chocolate all over, um, break it up in my teeth and put it all over my tongue, and then press it to the palate of the mouth, the roof of the mouth. And notice like, the first impression, and then see how it melts. And then you can start to chew it. And then once you've actually ingested it, the best part of this for me is sort of the lingering finish. And you get that by sipping in a bit of breath into through your nose and holding it in your mouth and then tasting the breath in your mouth. And that gives you this incredible, I think, finish and reference to what you just ate. And then do it again <laughs> and again and again and again. No. And, um, and that's when you get deeper into this experience. So to recap, there's a four-step creative process that starts in the origin of love, then inspiration and yields the experience in the product. And so my hypothesis is, can this manifestation of love in a product inspire just one out of 10,000 people that engage with one of these products to create their own love product in their own medium? And will the chain continue and continue and continue by example? And could we really bring peace to the world through chocolate or soap or theater or neighborhood development? I think yes. So thank you.